This evening, I'd like to um, read um, an encouraging truth from um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, but actually what I'd like to do is read uh, the entire chapter just because um, it has encouragements in many other areas, but we do want to look particularly this evening at the fact that in the Lord Jesus we have everything that we need. Let me begin in verse 1 of Philippians chapter 4. Paul writes to the church at Philippi, Therefore, my beloved brethren, whom I long to see, my joy and my crown, in this way stand firm in the Lord, my beloved. I urge Iodia and I urge Syntyche to live in harmony in the Lord. Indeed, true companion, I ask you to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel together with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names or in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last you have revived your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned before, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you've done well to share with me in my affliction. You yourselves also know, Philippians, that at the first preaching of the gospel after I left Macedonia, no church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, but you alone. For even in Thessalonica, you sent a gift more than once for my needs. Not that I seek the gift itself, but I seek for the profit which increases to your account. But I have received everything in full and have an abundance. I am amply supplied, having received from Epaphroditus what you sent, a fragrant aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brethren who are with me greet you. All the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to our uh, hearing this evening. Now, what we looked at this morning was, as I mentioned before, suggested uh, by our study on Wednesday night with Sinclair Ferguson, how important it is that Jesus' word lives uh, richly in us, that we see the connection between his word living in us and Jesus himself living in us, and how the Spirit uses his word to make us more like him. And again, the thrust this morning was be in the words, saturate yourselves with the word. It's so very important if you want to be like Jesus, if you want to have that spiritual strength. But Ferguson also reminded us that Jesus is not only in us, but we are said to be in him. As a matter of fact, he said that uh, perhaps um, the way that Christians are described in the New Testament more than any other is by those words, in Christ, in him. Paul writes, for instance, in 2 Corinthians 5, verses 30 and 31, but by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast 
in the Lord. Basically, God is the one who places us in the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Faith is really the evidence of that union. But in the Lord Jesus Christ, we have everything that we need. Paul basically gives us a mini summary. It's certainly not an exhaustive one of everything that is ours in him. We're going to look at some of these things uh, this evening. Uh, Jesus teaches us about this union in John chapter 15 using the image of a grapevine. That he is the vine and we are the branches. Now, he uses this analogy not only to teach us that he is in us, just as we were reminded, but that we are in him, that we are united to him, and that we draw our life from him as well as our ability to be able to bear fruit. Now, when the Spirit created this union, we know the life that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, this sap of the vine, as it were, which is symbolic of the Holy Spirit, flowed into our souls, and we were raised to life from spiritual death to spiritual life. And that is a, a very, uh, I want to say, a, one of the major blessings, one of the major resources that we have in Jesus Christ. We have his life. We have his spirit dwelling in us. But this union gave us more than a spiritual resurrection, as important as that is. It also gave to us certain blessings and resources. Now, Ferguson didn't have time to list what all these resources are, and we certainly don't have time to be able to list them or to look at them all this evening, but I thought it would be helpful for us to reflect on some of them to understand what is ours in the Lord Jesus Christ so we know what we might be able to expect from the Lord when we need his help, which we need, of course, every day. Now, the first thing we need to understand is that we need faith if we are to draw on these resources. I think um, we understand they're in the Lord Jesus Christ, but we need to understand a little bit more about this, this union between us and Christ because it explains why the resources actually are ours. Now, Jesus says in John 15, verse 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. And talk about resources. I mean, the Lord says you can ask for whatever you want, and he will do it for you. And, of course, we know that if he abides in us, we abide in him. There are going to be certain things we ask for and certain things we don't ask for. But I do want you to notice here the condition of getting this blessing, of being able to acquire these resources. The condition is that we must be in union with him. There must be this mutual abiding of Christ in us and we in him. But the way that that union actually takes place, as it's described in other places in Scripture, is through faith. Faith is what connects us to the vine so that Christ lives in us and we live in him. And this is why I believe our Lord said to his disciples on another occasion that the condition to receive the blessings or the resources that he has for us is faith. He says in Matthew 21, verses 21 through 22, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, which he cursed and withered, but even if you say to this mountain, be taken up and cast into the sea, it will happen. And all things you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Now, notice how he parallels this mutual abiding, this union with faith, because faith is actually what brings this union about. Jesus is telling us that we must have faith. We have to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior who must receive him, but we must also trust him to give us what he has promised that he would give us. We must trust the Lord. Now, I should also point out something else Jesus said in this Matthew passage. It's also true that our ability to draw upon the resources of the Lord Jesus will depend on how strong our faith is. The stronger it is, the more we will receive. The weaker it is, the less we will receive. Jesus said, we must not 
doubt. And of course, James reminds us when we're asking for wisdom. God will give it to us, but we must not doubt. We must not be like one driven, tossed about by the winds and the waves of the sea. He says, let not that person expect he'll receive anything from the Lord. We need to trust in Jesus. But why does faith give us the ability to draw on his resources? I think this is really very encouraging. It's because by faith, we enter into a relationship, a new relationship with him. Faith is how we're connected to the vine, but being connected to the vine, we, we have a, a relationship with the Lord that's described in a variety of ways. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we become his. We become, as it were, branches of the vine. We become members of the body. But the Bible says we also enter into a relationship with him as that of a husband and wife. And we're married to him, basically. And even as a husband and wife share in everything they possessed as individuals before they were married, so when we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and are married to him, we begin to share in everything that Jesus possesses. His resources become ours. The Bible also says that we become part of his family. We become part of the family of God. We become the, the children of God, Jesus' brothers and sisters, and as such, we also become heirs uh, with him of the kingdom and all the blessings of the kingdom. Paul writes in Romans 8, verses 16 and 17, the Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Notice there's a condition here too, the if we suffer with him. Let me just remind you that Sinclair Ferguson is going to remind us of what Jesus says in the Upper Room Discourse, and that is if we belong to him, the world will hate us. We will be hated, but he will help us. He helps us through these resources that he gives to us through our union with him. Everything the Father gives to Jesus has become ours in the Lord Jesus Christ because we are now fellow heirs with him. Faith is what places us in Christ where those resources actually are, and it gives to us a whole variety of things. Initially, it, it applies Christ to our souls. In him, as we read earlier, what Paul was saying to the uh, church at Corinth, in him, we have forgiveness. In him, we are clothed with his righteousness, with his obedience. In him, we are justified. The Father views us now as though we have never sinned and as though we have always obeyed. Not because this is true of us personally. It won't be in this world, but because it's true of the Lord Jesus Christ and that is what puts us in the family of God. By the way, I couldn't help but mention um, that this is what God intends baptism also to show us, the union that we have with the Lord Jesus through the work of the Holy Spirit by the washing of regeneration. It's that work of the Holy Spirit that places us in the Lord Jesus Christ. As Paul said to the church at Corinth, by one spirit, we have all been baptized into one body. That's what makes us part of the bride. That's what brings us into the family. So that as his sons and daughters, we now have all the rights and privileges of the children of God. So faith is what brings us into the family of God. And in the family of God, we have access to all of these blessings, all of these resources. But now really to be able to receive them, we do need to know that we are in the family of God. Now this change of relationship we have with Jesus Christ can in and of itself become a resource or a blessing to us once we know that we really do belong to Him. And I think it does that by way of changing our motive for obedience which is one of the main things I think that can sometimes weigh over our heads, 
keeping us from really serving the Lord as we should and being able to draw from him what we should because we still live as slaves. We still live like those perhaps sometimes outside of Jesus rather than living like those who actually belong to him, those who are children. Now, we were slaves before we came to the Lord Jesus Christ. We were slaves to fear, slaves to the fear of judgment. That may have been our main motive for obeying, if, if indeed we obeyed at all. When I say obey, I mean basically in quotation marks because nobody outside of Jesus really obeys him. We had some fear of the Lord that probably kept us away from doing things worse than what we actually did. And perhaps that fear also moved us to do some things to try to appease our conscience that was constantly telling us that we were falling short. Well, you know, when we struggle with, with our assurance that we really do belong to Jesus, sometimes we can end up serving him for exactly the same reason as slaves rather than as sons. We tend to think that we have to somehow convince ourselves or convince God that we really do belong to him. We need to keep up a certain standard a certain level of piety, of works, as long as we go to church so many times, as long as we read our Bibles and we pray for X amount of time, as long as we give so much money to the church that God will accept us. Sometimes true believers can actually spend their whole lives living under this kind of fear that they really don't belong to the Lord because they don't measure up to his standard. The same thing actually can happen. Actually, it almost teaches us to do this when we believe that our salvation actually does depend on our continuing to exercise faith and continuing to obey and looking to that rather than to Jesus Christ. And that's really what we're taught when we believe that salvation is, is something that, that we actually get from the Lord by our faith when we turn faith into a work. And there are some in the history of the church who have basically said that you are only saved as long as you are walking on, on well, in exact perfection, on the type, type road, as it were, and you don't waver to the left or to the right. As soon as you step out of line, you're lost and you have to be saved again. But if you have that kind of mentality, then you realize that you are continually keeping yourself in the grace of Christ through your works. Now that is what legalism is, legalism. Legalism isn't the idea that if you're a believer, you have to obey the Lord. You know, there's this whole thing that took place, may still be going on today. The idea that to say that Jesus must be Lord of your life in order for him to be your savior, they would say that's legalism because you're adding works to salvation. Well, that's the way it was when I was going to college. It seemed to be the majority view of those on campus that that was adding works to salvation and destroying the gospel, and that was legalism. But that isn't legalism because that is clearly what the Lord teaches us in his word that we must do and we will do if we have trusted Jesus. These are the things he will do through us by his Holy Spirit. Well, what is legalism? Legalism is the belief that God will not accept us unless we measure up to his standard, unless we do a certain amount of work. It's when we add what we're doing to Jesus in order to be accepted by God. You know, that's exactly what Luther was reacting against in his day because that's what the church of his day was teaching. And when the church in that day criticized Luther for not believing that we must work with the help of God's grace to reach a certain standard before we can actually go to heaven, he replied to them by pointing to what Paul said in Romans chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Paul writes this, he says, Now to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Paul says in another place that if it is by works, then it's no longer grace. Grace is something that is freely given. 
a favor, something Jesus earns and he gives to us. But the one who works, his wage is not a favor. It is what is due to him. God gives us salvation freely as a gift by his grace. And that's why we must receive it by faith because faith is, is the opposite of works. Faith is looking away from us and our works to Jesus and to Jesus alone to make us right. That's what the gospel is. That's what the good news is, that God forgives and accepts us as we are in Christ. And what we are is we're personally unrighteous. He justifies the ungodly. But in Jesus, we are perfectly righteous. Well, this change of relationship through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, through this mercy and forgiveness, gives us a new motive also to obey. No longer under the slavish fear that if I don't measure up, God's going to destroy me, but rather out of love and thankfulness for the sins he has forgiven me and for accepting me in the Lord Jesus Christ. Love in place of fear. Now, let me say this, that that doesn't mean the fear of the Lord is no longer a part of our lives. It should still be there. It will still be there. But it's, if we're in Christ, it's no longer a fear of judgment because Jesus was judged in our place. It's not a fear of the kind of retribution that God is going to pour out on his enemies because we're in the Lord Jesus Rather, it is a fear of the Lord's discipline that we know comes from a hand that loves us. I mean, God is a God to be respected, and He is a God to be feared, and we do need to respect Him. But we do need to remember He loves us because we are in Jesus Christ. So knowing that we are connected to the vine through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, that we are His bride, that we are His children is in and of itself a great blessing in that it changes the way we view ourselves and our relationship to God and gives us new motives. I, I should say it sets us free, doesn't it? Because to live under that slavish fear our entire lives, not knowing whether God's going to accept us or not, is, is a hard burden to bear. But knowing that He loves us as His children and that He is committed to helping us get through this world into the next and that He will do that, is a tremendous blessing that should bring a tremendous amount of joy. And we can serve the Lord out of love when we have that view, knowing that to be true. I should also mention, as Ferguson did, it should also change the way we view each other. When somebody professes to know the Lord and to love the Lord Jesus Christ, as we had several people do this morning, we are called also to love them and to receive them as brothers and sisters in the Lord, even though they too are not perfect. None of us are perfect. And we're not going to be perfect in this life, and that's why we need to remember. So we should always, if they're professing faith in Jesus, we should think the best of them, and we should do everything we can to help them, come alongside of them in love to help them be the best that they can be, all the while loving one another in our imperfections. But now knowing that we are his children through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and knowing that he has pledged these resources to us in Christ should also encourage us to look to him for all of our needs. If we know we're children, we know that we will receive these things because he has promised to give us these things. Let me read another encouraging passage from Matthew 7, verses 7 through 11. Jesus says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask Him? Remember, Jesus was addressing the Sermon on the Mount to His disciples, and they were those who trusted in Him. And He says, 
God was their father and that he loved them and that he wanted to do good to them. And all they had to do was ask. Now, the reason, again, God gives us these blessings is because he is our father, because he has adopted us into his family, because of what Jesus Christ has done. It's because we're connected to the vine, because by faith we are in Christ. And that's where the blessings are, in him. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 1.20, as we read in our meditation, for as many as are the promises of God in him, they are yes. Therefore, also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. All the promises of God are guaranteed to us in Jesus. If we are in him, they belong to us in, in every area, everything that he's promised. Why were we able... To be able to, why were we able to draw on the comfort of God's promises when it came, uh, well, when our brother Joseph fell asleep, right? It's because of the promise that Jesus gave us, that he comes for his own when they fall asleep, and he takes them to the place that he has prepared for them in heaven. It's because Joseph belonged to Jesus. He was in Jesus, and that promise applied to him. And because we know the Lord honors those promises, it gives us also comfort as well. Now, how are we going to be able to find that same comfort when it comes time for us to face death? And all of us are going to have to face it because of the curse. We're only going to find it in Christ. How are we going to be able to find the same kind of contentment that the Apostle Paul found, as I was reading in Philippians chapter 4, the ability to, to be content in all circumstances. Well, we can only find it in Christ. He says, I, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. When he was in need, Christ was the one who supplied what he needed to survive. When he was in plenty, Christ kept him from uh, being caught up in those riches uh, and turning away from him. No matter what the circumstances Paul had to face, and if you read uh, 2 Corinthians, I think it's in chapter 9, he gives this huge catalog of things that he had to endure. And we sometimes, you know, balk under the difficulties we have to face, and we think, how can I hang on? How can I continue to move forward in all these difficulties? Well, look at what Paul had to suffer, my goodness. Stoned and beaten and shipwrecked and out in exposure. I mean, one time he was stoned to death. And the Lord raised him again to life. And he just continued to do what the Lord called him to do. I mean, talk about difficulties. But he was able to do that because he found the resources that he needed in Jesus Christ. Nobody has the ability to do that on their own, but Jesus does. And that's why we need to trust in him and look to him. How can we know that he's going to help us overcome our sins, which are many, and become more like Jesus? How do we know that he's going to meet all of our needs and be with us through all of our difficulties and bring us to heaven? That when we ask him for guidance, he's going to show us the right way, that he's going to help us to do what he has called us to do, that he's even going to make a way where there doesn't appear to be a way, as Henry reminded us on Wednesday night as we were thinking about the different resources that are in Christ. He makes a way. He is that resource. How do we know all these things are going to be ours? It's because in Christ, Paul says, all the promises of God are yes. We are united to him by faith. And in him, we have unlimited resources. And so what we need to do is we need to look to him in faith. We need to believe, first of all, that what he says here is true. He exists. He's done these things. He's guaranteed these promises. Everything God said is true. That all these things are a reality. And then we need to look to him in faith and draw upon those resources. We need to ask him for the things that we need. Again, Jesus says to you this evening, as he said to his disciples so long ago in Luke 11, 9 through 10, again, mirroring what we saw in uh, Matthew chapter 7, the Sermon on the Mount. He says, so I say to you, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will 
be opened. He will give these things to you because in Christ they belong to you. That is the grace that God gives to you through the Lord Jesus and that union that we have with him. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And thank the Lord for these mercies.